Waterloo, gateway to the southwestern commuter belt, the New Forest, the West Country, and the Isle of Wight. By the mid-60s, Waterloo is the last major bastion of steam in the capital, and enthusiasts flock to see BR standards and bullied Pacifics. The four core electric sets have not yet developed the cult following which they will later achieve, and Jeff Todd's film record is appropriate. Generations of holiday makers and enthusiasts have passed through Waterloo en route to the Isle of Wight and we will make the same journey. But first a bit about the island. It is diamond shaped, some 20 miles wide by 13 deep. The three principal ports are Cowes at the apex of the island, reach from Southampton, Yarmouth in West Wight, reach from Lymington and Ryde a few miles to the east of Cowes and served by Portsmouth. We shall travel on the Portsmouth route. As we head for Portsmouth, we discover that we are in the strong country. At Portsmouth Harbour Station, it is just a few yards to the steamers which will take us to the Isle of Wight. The paddle steamer Sandown joined the Southern Fleet in 1934, coming from the celebrated Denny Yard on the Clyde. Her maiden voyage was appropriately from Portsmouth to her name town of Sandown, but she was ordinarily employed on the ride services. She could accommodate 900 passengers and was capable of 14 and a half knots. When Jeff Todd filmed her in 1965, she was nearing the end of her life and was to be withdrawn the following year. During the war, the Sandown and her sister ship, the Ride, were taken over by the Admiralty for service as minesweepers. We also see one of the post-war Denny trio of motor ships, the South Sea, Brading and Shanklin. Until the 1960s, the combination of the Adams O2 tank, such as 33 Bembridge, and the graceful paddle steamers made Ride Pier Head a magnet for steam lovers. There was a sense of anticipation as the steamer approached Pier Head with its southern region green signs. Crowds would disembark and scurry along the platform. Soon there would be a train on its way. But there would be another train before long. 30, Shorewell, pushes the stock down the platform for out of running round at Pier Head. 23 of the Adams O2 tanks were transferred to the island between 1923 and 1949. To suit them for their duties on the Isle of Wight, they received Westinghouse air brakes and in due course extended bunkers. There was plenty of activity at Pier Head, with stock backed out, locos running round, then backing the stock partway into the platform to water and finally propelling it in. 
Well into the 1960s, the engines were kept in lovely condition. We will join the train for the run to ride St John's Road Station. 18 Ningwood makes a spirited departure from St John's Road in 1964. With the demise of Newport Shed, St John's Road looked after the loco fleet. The works were on the opposite side of the line. A well-filled Ventnor train approaches St John's Road in 1964. Thirty-five, Freshwater, one of two 044 tanks to carry motor fittings, departs for Pier Head. St John's Road Bridge provides a convenient vantage point for filming. Twenty-six, Whitwell, comes off shed at St John's Road. The locomotives carried names belonging to towns and villages in the Isle of Wight. Twenty-six will run light to Pier Head. She was the first O2 tank to receive an extended bunker back in 1932. Number 32, Bonchurch, is in her last season as she enters St John's Road en route to Pier Head in 1964. This film record is from John Laird. Number 20, Shanklin, one of the first pair of O2s to come to the island in 1923, arrives with a Ventnor train. At the other end of the station, another service leaves for Pier Head. We pull out on the double track section towards Smallbrook Junction, where we will turn west towards Cowes. Twenty six Whitwell, loose shunts her coaches down the platform prior to running round. Shunting at all three termini to survive into the nineteen sixties was complex and added to the fun for enthusiasts. Stock was gravity shunted back into the platform and the locomotive would follow in to couple up. Cows and Newport line trains carried white root discs above the left and right hand buffers. Ventnor trains carried a root disc below the chimney. Roster discs, which gave the engine duty number, were also carried and are added to the diversity. Eventually, 26 is ready to depart. Number 22, Braiding, arrives with another service.
Braiding performs the usual shunting moves, propelling the stock backwards and will then of course run round. With years of use, many of the root discs had become rather grimy and weathered. Twenty-two braiding pulls away from Newport and onto the impressive curved viaduct across the River Medina. Major roadworks have obliterated every trace of the railway in this area. The Sandown route diverged to the right at the far end of the viaduct. Number 29, Alverstone, enters Newport with a coal train from Medina Wharf, for coal continued to be moved by rail well into the 1960s. Twenty-nine has a good deal of shunting to do. As no new wagons had been delivered to the Isle of Wight for many years, traffic continued to be handled in old wooden-bodied wagons. It was one of the last places on British railways where such vintage stock was to be seen. We return to ride Esplanade in time to see a train departing for Pier Head. Twenty six Whitwell comes in from Pier Head en route to Cowes. As 22 braiding enters Esplanade, another journey is almost over. It is time for another trip with a quick look at Ride St John's Shed. This time we will travel south to Roxall on the Ventnor Line. The Ventnor Line was the busiest of the routes on the island. With the intensive services, trains frequently crossed at Roxall. Isle of Wight engine men needed the skills of county cricketers, as we discover. Journey's end is Ventnor, where number 21, Sandown, will water before running round. One platform had normal access, but a second island platform had neither a footbridge nor a subway. Passenger access is via a ship's gangway, which must be removed before a train or engine can run by. It is another peculiarity of the Isle of Wight system. 
Departure from Ventnor was always dramatic, with the tunnel just beyond the station throat. Number 29, Alverstone, burst out of the single bore tunnel through St Boniface Downs and into Ventnor Station. We will head back to Ryde, crossing another Ventnor train en route. Ride, we return briefly to the St John's Road overbridge. John Laird visited the double track section from Ride to Smallbrook Junction. 30 Shorewell heads for Ride. In winter, Smallbrook Box was switched out and the two lines were worked as parallel single tracks from St John's, reducing line capacity but saving on manpower. 29, Alverstone heads for Ride. Number 35, Freshwater, was one of the last pair of O2s to come to the island in 1949 and is heading for Ventnor. Thirty-two Bond Church calls at St John's Road before pulling away for Pier Head. After a glimpse of 17 Sea View on Shed, a coal train drifts slowly into St John's Station. We will join a train for Pier Head. calling it Esplanade. At Pier Head, number 22 Braiding will propel her stock clear of the crossover before running round. The Westinghouse pumps made a characteristic panting noise which added a great deal of charm and interest to the island's railways. We journey back to 1953, when the passenger stock was in B.R. Carmen, as was the Ride Pier tram. It is not yet summer, the Smallbrook Junction is switched out, the crossover dull and the signal arms removed. At Sandown, there's plenty of stock in the sidings adjoining the Isle of Wight Central line. We cross an immaculate 24 Calborn at Shanklin. We pause briefly at Roxall.
At Bentner, we have a real treat with some of the few known film clips of number 19, Osborne, was drawn as long ago as 1955. The Bembridge branch train arrives at Brading. We'll run round. The Bembridge branch diverges from the Ventnor line at Brading. There is one intermediate station, St Helens. We will have a trip along the Bembridge branch, which opened in May 1882 and closed in September 1953. The intermediate station, St Helens, was an impressive location. At Bembridge, space was limited and a turntable was used at the buffer stop end of the loops instead of points to save space. The line was built by an independent company, but worked from the outset by the Isle of Wight Railway and taken over by that company later on. Our footplate trip shows the ventilation holes in the cab sheet just below the roof. We will take a trip over the Isle of Wight Central Line from Sandown to Merstone Junction and Newport. The first station was Alverstone. New Church comes next. Services ceased over this section in 1956. Horringford was another pretty little station serving a few scattered houses. At Merstone, the IWC branch from Ventnor West curved in. This had closed in 1952. Shide was the last station before Newport. The junction with the ride line at Newport was on the viaduct east of the station. The sheds are visible to the right. The Freshwater Yarmouth and Newport Railway had been independent until 1923 and had an awkward junction at Newport involving trains reversing in or out of the station. The departure was on a sharp curve. Fresh water, due to close within a few months, looked dingy. After the closures of the 1950s, the Cows Newport Ride and Ventnor Shanklin Ride lines survived. A growing number of enthusiasts were to visit the island and modern forms of transport had made their appearance. The hovercraft terminal was at Esplanade Station. Esplanade provided a splendid vantage point to look out towards Pierhead Station. The pier trams were now in southern region green. A Ventnor train is approaching Esplanade. We'll take a brief look at St John's Road Shed. 
sadly, many of the engines are now showing signs of age. A Ventnor train is climbing away from Ride St John's, her destination clearly indicated by the route disc. We cross another Ventnor train, this time with just one route disc. Right from John's approach. Number 35, Freshwater, picks up the staff at speed at Smallbrook Junction. How did this fascinating system evolve? As we journey to Ventnor, let us find out. The first section to open was the Cows and Newport in June 1862. This became part of the Isle of Wight Central Railway in 1887. The Isle of Wight Railway opened from St John's Road to Shanklin in August 1864, but due to the tunnel near Ventnor, did not reach its southern terminus until 1866. The Ride and Newport Railway connected with the Isle of Wight Railway and Cowes Line from 1875. It became part of the Isle of Wight Central. The Bembridge Line opened in 1882 and soon fell into Isle of Wight Railway hands. The line from Sandown to Merstone and Newport took 11 years to build from 1868 to 1879 and became a part of the Isle of Wight Central. The central branch to Ventnor opened in 1900. The remaining line, the Freshwater Yarmouth and Newport, had opened in 1889, but had a tempestuous relationship with the Isle of Wight Central. To add a final eccentricity, the section from Ride St John's to Pier Head was built by the London and South Western and London Brighton and South Coast Railways jointly, as the local company seemed unable to find the funds. It was worked by the local companies, however. Jeff Todd has captured the activity at Ventnor in a series of scenes which recall the character of this unique station in its deep chalk cutting. The Ventnor Tunnel, although it has not seen trains for many years, continues to serve a useful purpose for public utility services. Back at Pier Head, the tram is shuttling to and fro. By 1965, the railway is showing signs of weariness, but engines still have a hard task and will continue to work until electrification of the Ventnor route as far as Shanklin is completed. The rest of the system is doomed to abandonment.
that the railways could continue for so many years with such vintage stock is a tribute to the railwaymen who worked the island's lines and who as well as being highly professional were extremely friendly and considerate to visiting enthusiasts. Twenty-six Whitwell heads south with another Ventnor working, her smoke box badly rusted. The double track section as far as Smallbrook Junction is still well worth a visit. The passenger stock was in southern region green and was all maintained at Ride Works. To see the carpenters maintaining vintage stock of this age was a fascinating experience. Whitwell approaches Smallbrook with a ride train. The signalman takes the staff as 28 Ashley passes by. 21 Sandown leaves Smallbrook en route to Ride as a southbound train waits in the distance. train with number 30 Shorewell diverges onto the Newport line at Smallbrook Junction. The Cow's route provided attractive views of the River Medina. The footbridge at Cowes, which spanned the platform, was not for passengers at all, but was to maintain a public right-of-way which crossed the station site. It also provided a convenient location for photographers. Cowes station was on a sharply curved site. Once more, coaches are propelled out, but it will not be for much longer that we can witness these scenes. The station has not seen a visit from the weed-killing train for a long time. The station is approached by narrow streets, typical of cows, a quaint but delightful town. <laughs> 
holiday makers board the train for the journey back to ride. Soon it is departure time. A hundred years of history on the cow's line will soon be drawing to a close. Although the system was run down, it still offered plentiful opportunities for the photographer. As at Sandown, where the line ran beside a park near the cliffs. Peer Head was as fascinating as ever. The low evening sun makes an evocative scene. Once again, we dive into the tunnel just beyond Esplanade Station. St John's Road Bridge provides a vantage point again. Turning the other way, we look to St John's Box and the bracket signal which controlled movements at the south end of the station. In summer, this had two main arms. In winter, four arms, when Smallbrook Junction was closed. We see it in its winter configuration. The signalman comes forward to pick up the single line token of an inbound train. Double track was installed by the Southern Railway between Braiding and Sandown to facilitate handling the heavy services on what was otherwise mostly a single track system. Until the 1960s, the Ventnor line carried a quarter hourly service with an hourly service to Newport and Cowes. On summer Saturdays, additional trains terminated at Shanklin. Because of loading gauge restrictions, modern BR stock could not operate on the island, and until the end of steam, almost 70 LBSC or South Eastern and Chatham bogey coaches were in regular use. In this program, you may have seen the large coach set numbers. There were four Newport sets in the 60s, 485 to 488. The seven ride sets, ran from 490 to 500. In winter, they were all three coach formations, but in summer, the Ventnor sets were increased to six vehicles. Extra coaches might be added as required. The existence of this large fleet of pre-group Brighton and Southeastern passenger stock, together with former LSWR tank engines, gave a unique character to the Allard line. The road bridge at Roxall provided an attractive vantage point as a train heads towards Ride.
Today, Ventnor Station is an industrial estate and trees have grown up above the tunnel mouth, so these views cannot be repeated. Until the 1960s, it was a busy, if quaint, station, which we explore from a variety of vantage points. One oddity was that many of the coal merchants had their offices in caves in the cliff face. Some of the caves remain in use today. If you knew the island lines in steam days, you will relive your own memories as well as enjoying the scenes you are watching. If your acquaintance with the white lines is more recent, this is what it was like. And it is thanks to the filmmakers such as John Laird, Jeff Todd and Derek Norman that we can travel back in time as we have. Quite a lot of climbing work was involved in getting these scenes. As a Ventnor train approaches Smallbrook Junction, we discover that a sleeper has been clamped across the rails of the now abandoned Cow's Line. BR had proposed closure of the entire system, but this was wisely turned down due to the intolerable road congestion which would ensue. The ride Shanklin section was to remain, but the Cow's Line closed in February 1966 and the Shanklin Ventnor section that April. The Adams O2 tanks were very elderly and BR decided to replace them with 1923 London Underground stock which was surplus due to LT modernisation plans. Electrification work commenced in the last months of steam operation. We will visit the Clapham area to see the new stock during trials prior to transfer to the Ireland. The 1923 LT stock was marshalled into four or three coach sets, amusingly classified as four vec or three tis, recalling the Latin name for the Isle of Wight, vectis. The stock originally appeared in BR Rail Blue, later in two-tone blue and grey, and finally in Network Southeast colours. Derek Norman filmed one of the dwindling band of O2s just north of Smallbrook in 1966. Paintwork was now shabby, and nameplates had mostly gone. However, a lingering pride in their steeds had led to homemade replacement plates on many engines. So the delightful Allen names implemented at the behest of A.B. McLeod during the 1920s were to survive. Enthusiasts were now plentiful, as were special trips. But as the weeks rolled by, the system became ever more tired. To those who knew the Allen just a few years earlier, the decline was tragic. Steam services ended on the 31st of December, 1966. To facilitate electrification work, no trains ran until March 1967. The new era dawns. Briefly, the paddle steamer Ride 
could still be seen. The signal box survived at Ride Pier Head for a while, and the station was still a hive of activity. The Ride Pier tramway also survived for a time. And although the steam trains had gone, there was still plenty to look at. Semaphore signalling was still in use at Pier Head. Both platforms were still in use at Esplanade, for many passengers took the train from Pier Head and transferred to Road at the adjacent bus station. Beyond Esplanade, the underground sets became underground once more as they dived under ride through the tunnel. This has always been a restricting feature of the stock which could work on the island. The seven-car formation approaches Sandown, which retained its signal box and the double-track section from braiding for a while. A red disc was used in place of a tail lamp. Southern influence remained strong. had gone, but the railway had gained a new lease of life and, with 1923 underground stock, became a mecca for electric traction enthusiasts. At Esplanade, another set starts away towards Pier Head. In the distance, the paddle steamer Ride is awaiting her passengers. Much has changed, but Ride was to delight enthusiasts for a little while to come. By the late 1980s, the 1923 underground stock was nearing the end of its life, and thoughts turned to new stock. In Ireland terms, this meant newer second-hand stock, and the choice fell upon 1938 underground stock, which was rapidly being replaced by LT. An impressive inauguration ceremony was arranged at Ride Pier Head to welcome the new stock, which was resplendent in full network southeast colours. Needless to say, this included breaking of the ceremonial banner. The media were well represented. A special press trip on the 51-year-old new stock had been arranged. After steam services ended in the 1960s, preservationists had rebuilt and reopened the section between Wootton and Haven Street. With friendly relations between Network South East and the steam railway, the preserved line was to extend to Smallbrook Junction where a new station was to be built. An unveiling ceremony took place. Today, Allen Line trains call at the new platform at Smallbrook.
passengers can make a convenient connection with the Isle of Wight steam railway services. These reached Smallbrook in 1991. As well as number 24 Calbourne, the last surviving Adams 02 tank, the steam railway acquired two former Brighton Terriers, both of which had seen service on the island. Number 8 Freshwater had been sold by the Brighton to the LSWR, leased to the Freshwater Yarmouth and Newport, then sold to the FYN. It came into southern ownership, returned to the mainland in 1949, and after service at Hailing Island, became a static attraction at a pub. She was finally restored as number eight Freshwater, a truly remarkable career for a fascinating locomotive. As number eight leaves Smallbrook, let us pay tribute to the amazing efforts of the preservationists who have made this all possible. station owes its present form to a BR rebuilding due to subsidence of the old platform. The original Ryde and Newport Railway Station building still survive as a private residence. Haven Street, headquarters of the preserved line in 1994. Number eight enters the station from Wooten, as she has done for many years in the past and will for many years to come. <laughs> 